It's good to see you guys, all of you out there on the field. My name is Kevin. I'm one of the pastors around here, and we are glad you are with us as we wrap up this series uh, called Essential Oils. We're not making fun of those of you who are into essential oils. I don't get it. Uh, they just seem like really overpriced vials in a treasure chest. Like, I don't I totally understand it. But what we've actually been talking about is how essential oil was in, you know, like the first century world of Jesus' time in the Old Testament, ancient Jewish world. And there's a lot of stories throughout the Bible that center around oil being used for different things. And so we just kind of have focused into a couple of those stories over the last couple of weeks. And while, as far as I know, I don't use any essential oils in my life, my cousin did send me this meme this week that I feel like at least a lot of you can relate with because this definitely seems like an essential oil that I want to put on everything, right? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure that counts, but I'll take, I like that one. Um, but yeah, so what, what, what we've actually been looking at is that, that there are just tons of accounts from religious moments where oil was used to anoint someone. We looked at King David being prepared and set apart to many other times where oil is used as an analogy or actually as something that teaches us something about who God is, how faithful he is, or how we relate to his kingdom. In fact, in, in the passage we're going to look at today, if you have a Bible, I want you to open up to the book of Matthew, first book in the New Testament, to chapter 25. We're going to start in verse one, open up there, and what you find is a parable known as the parable of the ten virgins, and I bet there are some of you in this room who have never read this, but I bet there's a bunch of you who have heard about this or read this as some point, had no idea what it meant and just kept reading, moved right on, right? This is one, I don't think I've ever heard a sermon about this parable because there's a lot of times where we read stuff and we're just like, I don't know what to do with that. So we just move on to like the next story. This seems like one of those where Jesus is teaching us a parable or through parables. Parables are a story about a different story. It's like, um, like the way a dictionary works. In order to define a word, we use a bunch of other words that we know the, the meaning of to define that new word. Parables are kind of the same thing. To define the kingdom of God and, and how the, the, this concept beyond us works or how to relate with God's kingdom and Jesus, he uses parables a lot to help build metaphors so that we can understand it, what it is. Now, in that, then, we have a task to do that we never just like jump to assuming we know what something means. We have to dig into understanding what it meant then in their culture before we try to apply it to our lives. So here's the context as you're getting to Matthew 25. If you don't have a Bible, we'll put the words up on the screen here for you. Well, what's happening in the context, this is a really, really important week in the history of the world. This is the last week that Jesus uh, is alive before like the whole crucifixion and that stuff. He comes back for a little while and leaves, but like this is a really, really important week in human history. And what, ha what happens in the story, you know the Easter kind of story, like Sunday starts with Palm Sunday. It's when Jesus came back to Jerusalem. He didn't run from Jerusalem. He came back to the place where they were looking for him. They didn't like him. They didn't like the things he was saying and claiming. But he rides in on a donkey. People hail him as the future king. They wanted a Messiah who would be like a, a militant warrior leader kind of guy and overthrow the powers that be, which were Rome. So they start singing songs like Hosanna, hailing him as a king. It's like this big celebration, but to Jesus it was not. Uh, in fact, in Luke it says that he wept as he overlooked the city as he rode in because not only did he know what was ahead for him that week, he knew the destruction that would come upon Jerusalem in the coming generations because Israel, like God's special people, that temple, that system was supposed to be this life-giving thing to the world. And it had gotten off track. Jesus would, would indict it as empty, as full of hypocrisy, and so when you read the stories, Jesus goes right from like being riding in as a king and being hailed as such to overthrowing tem temple tables. So the very next thing he does is start making people really mad. He starts saying things and doing things that are the kind of things you do when you're trying to pick a fight. So if you ever wonder why Jesus got crucified, read those stories. The religious leaders did not like him. They did not like what he was saying or what he was doing. All of that, of course, would lead to the Last Supper, to his betrayal, to his um, false fake trial stuff, to him being crucified, ultimately leaving the tomb empty. But this story happens on Tuesday. So you have to see it in that context. And what's happening is he's overturning tables and he's indicting the religious system of that world. He is starting to talk about what will come for those of them for, who follow him as the Messiah. That, that it'll be no longer about that temple or that place. It'll be about those who put their faith in him. So he says things like, I'm gonna destroy the temple in three days and rebuild it. And everyone's like, what? Like the temple was one of the wonders of the world. It was huge and beautiful and magnificent. Like that was impossible. That was a ridiculous thing to say. He, he started saying all kinds of stuff that were, were confusing people, including his own disciples who like knew him the best. And they don't wanna ask the question out loud because they 
probably felt like they should know the answer, so they wanted to pretend to know the answer. So they pulled Jesus aside in Matthew 24, the beginning, and they asked him this question. This is how it reads in Matthew 24, verse three. Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives. This is the big hillside that overlooks the temple and all of Jerusalem. The disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? They're confused. So what Jesus does is he launches in to a long teaching. He tells a bunch of different parables through the rest of the two, next two chapters, the rest of 24 and 25. It's known as the Olivet Discourse as he's gonna to try to teach them what his kingdom will be about, how to relate with them and all these different things. And that's what lands us on this parable known as the 10 virgins at the opening of Matthew 25. It's one of Jesus's answers, his response to that question. So let's read it. Start in verse one. We'll read all 13 verses. Read with me. This is Jesus speaking. At the time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but didn't take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took the oil, uh, oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all of the virgins woke up, trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourself. Remember, it's like midnight, so apparently they had 24-hour Myers back then or something. I don't know where they're gonna buy oil, but verse 10. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins, the wise ones who were ready, went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later, the others came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. I think, you probably feel like I do, when I've read this before, just going, okay. I don't know how that applies to me. I don't totally understand what all that means. And there seem to be a lot of components that like just seem weird. Like were all of these young virgins marrying this guy? And like it gets really confusing. So let's break it down a little bit. One, I think the funniest part is like why do they, have, like why are the, is their virginity brought up? Like why is that an adjective for these young ladies? It seems like an odd like thing to say about other people. We would never talk like that. But in their culture, uh, virginity was a huge deal. And it was really like the other way to say it is they were just young unwed women. That's who they were, right? So they were saying virgins. It just meant they weren't married and they were young women. But see, virginity back then was, was something that between the man and the woman was saved and cherished and protected as their greatest gift to one another on their wedding night. That is a little bit of a lost art in our culture, but it's what they practice and actually what, how God like created it. And so don't get hung up on that. Just think these are 10 young bridesmaids who have an honorary position in this wedding processional that's going on. And some of them were wise and prepared and some of them were not. Now, what's, what's interesting also about weddings back in their culture that's really important for us to, to take note of, is back then the groom was the focal point, not the bride. The groom was more important than the bride in their weddings. Can you imagine? Like, that's the exact opposite and to an extreme. Someone's clapping about it. I would, think about this. I remember back to my wedding day. I walked out on the stage with the pastor. No special music played. <laughs> not a single person stood up in honor of me as the groom. As far as I could tell, there was not a single tear that was shed. And then my wife walks in, right? The music changed and everybody stands up and a bunch of people start crying. Like, I'm not bitter about it. I'm just saying that's how it was. I'm not sure I even needed to be there, right? You're like, other than like, I'm gonna marry her, but like, it was all about her. Because that's how it is in our culture. In fact, it's always funny when you, you see the groom and all the grooms, when they all dress the same, because I think they're interchangeable. It's like, yeah, whoever, who cares? It's all about the bride, right? In their culture, though, it was completely different. It was, it was not only like the focal point was more about the groom than the bride, but it also, this wasn't just about two people who had fallen in love and we're all here to celebrate it like it is to us. This was a huge moment in the, in the history of these two families that were uniting. So this wasn't like an individual choice to get married. This was a family coming together. Families were uniting. Families were becoming stronger. And what would happen is the whole village would be involved. Like there was no RSVP. Everybody's gonna be at the wedding. And, and it was not abnormal for these to like, these processionals to go on into the night. And they, I mean, they partied big for like a week around this. It wasn't like a one day 
20 minute sermon, reception for a little while kind of a thing. This was a big, big deal. Everybody would have been a part of it. And what would happen in the processionals back then is they would start at the bride's home and they would make their way around to the groom's home. So even if the bride's home was right next to the groom's home, they would go out of their way because what they wanna do is they wanna go by every other home. It's like the party began in the processional and it would just pick up more people and momentum and they'd stop at this house and hang out and have a little party and then they'd go over to this house and tell stories and it would just build up like a snowball coming downhill, it would get bigger and bigger and bigger until ultimately it landed at the groom's home and everyone would pack in and the doors would be shut and they would have the celebration. So that's, that's how it went and because this is late at night and going into later in the night, like it's taking the bridegroom in this processional forever to get there, uh, these young bridesmaids have fallen asleep. They had not only an honorary position being a bridesmaid, they actually had a job, like a task, which is have your lamps and light the way, like there were no street lights back then. So they were like the final lighting of the processional into uh, the groom's home. Like that was their job, they had an actual duty. But this is where the the story gets awkward and the way Jesus wants to tell it is that five of them were wise, five were not. Now what Jesus is doing is creating a compare and contrast. And so they, they would do this throughout Jewish literature, read Proverbs or even other teachings Jesus had where he talks about the wise man builds his home upon the rock, like a solid foundation, the foolish man builds upon the sand, it's not solid, right? Like they do this a lot in comparison so we can compare our life and our choices, are we being wise or are we being foolish? So, so the story gets awkward where these five bridesmaids aren't prepared to do the task, the very thing that they're asked to do. Like your job as a bridesmaid is to do this, they weren't prepared for it, this would be like the best man like forgetting rings, and you don't realize until you're in the middle of the ceremony, that would be awkward. Or it'd be like a bridesmaid forgetting that she had to give a toast, or like I don't know what kind of wedding disasters you've had. I've done a lot of weddings, and I have had some moments at some weddings where I'm like, what is going on here? And some of them go to this church, so I can't talk about it, but they were really awkward. Uh, <laughs> serious moments, like crazy moments. In fact, I looked, at, there's obviously like tons of horror stories from weddings, but I looked a couple up, and I thought these were funny. This guy, Alberto, talked about a wedding he was at. He said, one of the bridesmaids arrived to the church massively hungover and started puking in front of everybody, completely trashed her dress, which just triggered a domino effect. Other kids and other people started puking all over the place. It was super disgusting. The bride's dad had to pay uh, extra to clean up the entire place, but the reception was cool. Uh, That's his story. Another one uh, from a gal named Randy. She said, I was at a wedding where the officiant didn't show up. Now, this is like my nightmare. I like am so afraid someday I'm gonna totally forget. They're gonna call me and I'm gonna ruin someone's very special day. I haven't done it yet. I'm just scared about it. Anyway, so she's at this wedding. The officiant didn't show up. It was a Friday evening. He forgot and he went fishing instead. So we all went to the reception without the actual marriage happening. After dinner, someone found a judge to come do the ceremony. The whole wedding party walked down the street to an outdoor gazebo. They got married. They came back and finished the reception. Like there are all kinds of stories like that. It happens and that's the picture Jesus is painting for us to understand this. It's like some people are invited to something that's an honor. It's amazing. It's incredible. But they don't take it seriously. They, they, don't, they don't prepare And so Jesus wants to paint this picture for us and five of them are wise and five of these young women are foolish. And the word that he uses is awesome. It's the Greek word moros, which is the same word we get the word moron from, which makes me like the story even more. Jesus is like, there are five who are very wise and five of these girls are morons and are about to mess up and miss out. So we know this about all of them. All of them were virgins, all of them had lamps, all of them had access to oil in which to burn the lamps, and all of them got tired and fell asleep. The problem isn't who fell asleep or who didn't or who was being lazy or not. What what Jesus wants us to notice, there are two ways these five young bridesmaids act foolish. And to compare that and ask and, and reflect on it in our own life, here's the first one. They acted foolish first in that they focused on appearance rather than substance. They focused on the appearance of being a bridesmaid, the appearance of having this honorary duty to perform in the wedding, but they didn't have the actual substance to do the job. Remember in verse three it said, the foolish ones took their lamps but didn't take any oil with them. Why would you do that? Oil is the thing that makes lamps do what lamps do. Without it, you can't. They just thought, ah, what's in there will be good enough. You have no idea how long the party's gonna go, how far into the night. They just didn't prepare. And when you read this story, Jesus wants us to ask us, why? Why didn't they do it? Well, the answer's simple. It's just that it was easier to not worry about it. It was easier for them to look the part than to be ready to do the part that they were tasked with. 
See, back then, oil, like I said, it was, it was essential to their life. They used it for cosmetic purposes, for cooking, for fueling lamps to light their homes or the streets. They used it in a lot of religious ceremonies from anointing people to burial preparation. Like oil was used all over the place. It was a very valuable commodity. It cost a lot. And it cost a lot to make for yourself. It was a tedious process of crushing grapes and filtering and doing all these things. So what we don't know is, is like, did they have, did they just not want to spend the time to make enough oil or did they not just want to spend the money to buy it? Either way, they didn't prepare. They weren't ready. They were foolish. Jesus wants us to see this because they tried to take a shortcut. Their plan was to have the lamp and appear to be able to do their job and bank on the generosity of someone else to bail them out if plans didn't work out. That is, is not a smart way to live your life or more importantly, to manage the resources and the time and the every day God has gifted you with. That is a dumb way to live, foolish, moronic. And think about this in your life. Where do you take shortcuts? Where do you have more of the appearance rather than the actual substance of that appearance. Where is that in your life? We do this as followers of Christ sometimes in our relationship with God. Some of us, we, like, we show up to church when it's convenient and like sometimes it's like once a month and then we can't figure out why we're not closer with God. So we think we can shortcut it? You can't. It's not how you'll grow in relationship with God. There are some of us in this room, we believe Jesus is the Lord of our life. We believe he's invited us into a relationship where we can commune with him every day, every minute of our life. We believe that the Bible is its authority that speaks to us and guides us. But some of us in here, we didn't open the Bible one time this week. We try to take shortcuts. It, it, you gotta know this. There is no sermon I or Keith or Brad or Dave could ever preach to you that will compete with what God wants to talk to you about and show you. Every day you open up the Bible for yourself and let him speak to you. If you don't do that, if you don't discipline yourself to practice that, there are no shortcuts to it. Maturing into who God's called you to be is up to you digging in and doing the work. You can have the appearance, but it takes a lot more to have the actual substance. And too often we're guilty of trying to find shortcuts to that, and it is a foolish way to live. That's what Jesus is telling us. Or maybe, maybe for you it's a financial thing. You take shortcuts in your finances. Check this out. This is a, a sad, sad stat. According to a recent survey by the Consumer Federation of America and the Financial Planning Association, indicated that 20% of Americans polled were counting on winning the lottery for their retirement. Like, that's not a joke. One out of five Americans' retirement plans and future stability in the future is dependent upon winning the mega million. Like, that's crazy. That's foolish. Do you live on a budget? Do you tithe faithfully? Do you trust God? Do you keep Christ at the center of the decisions you make with your money? If not, Jesus is saying, you might be really messing up. You might be living foolish. You might be trying to take some shortcuts. And these foolish young women, these bridesmaids, miss out on the opportunity to experience the joy of the celebration and the wedding because they forsook their responsibility to prepare diligently, to manage that which God had trusted them with and called them to. They were focused more on substance than Appearance, or more on appearance than substance. Where might that also be true in your world? Think, think like, it was social media makes this terrible. I bet you've got friends in your life who've gotten divorced and you were so surprised by it because it seemed like, at least according to Facebook, they had it all going on. Like, it seemed like the times you'd hung out with them, they had it. Because it's really easy in our culture to appear to have something that the actual substance is not there. Right, marriage is a whole lot harder than just what you post on Facebook. It takes practicing conflict resolution. It takes compromise. It takes some mutual submission to one another, trying to get up every day and out love, out serve one another. That's the substance of what makes marriage work. It doesn't matter how it appears. And if we're not careful, you and I can be foolish in appearing to be very spiritual or have a great marriage or have great kids or be very financially stable, but we are just burying ourselves or, or we're on like eggshells. Like we know it's like a, a house of cards. Really, this kind of boils down to just a character issue. It's taking seriously that which you have and you know to be right and doing it. Character is who you are when no one's looking. D.L. Moody said, character is who you are in the dark. It's understanding that you are who you are and God always sees it, no matter whether other people do or celebrate it or notice it. Your character matters and there are no shortcuts to have great character. Any shortcut to better character just leads you to disaster. And ultimately, what seems like a simple mistake in this story had huge consequences. They didn't get to be a part of the wedding. 
But you and I, if we don't take seriously the tasks and the responsibility God has given to us, if we care more about the appearance than the substance, you and I risk being left out. If we don't deal with the character flaws in our life and keep growing and maturing into the people God calls us to be, we risk being left out or, or cut off or burning bridges or breaking and ruining relationships. Every one of us. Like if you're new to church, you gotta know every person in this room, we all have a bunch of character flaws. Like it doesn't matter how long you've been at church, we all have stuff we need to deal with. We all do. And if we don't take it seriously, we're on the risk of messing up. Here's the second thing they did that was foolish that we need to pay attention to. Not only did they care about appearance over substance, the second is that they passed the blame. That like when it actually started to go down and they didn't have enough oil, they wanted someone else to, bo- to, to give them oil. Like they wanted someone else to bail them out. Like they made a choice not to bring the oil along for the night and then they wanted someone else to take responsibility for it. You and I do this all the time. When we didn't prepare, when we didn't plan, when we fail in those ways, we panic and we immediately shift to find someone or something that can fix it for us. Jesus is calling this foolish. That's a foolish way to live your life, to try to transfer responsibility of your problems, they are yours, no matter the origin and and whatever else happened. Here's a, a sobering reality for every one of us. No one can fix your character problems for you, only you and God. It doesn't matter whose fault they are. You might have one of those stories, there's a lot of us like this, We grew up in broken families. Horrible things have happened to us. There are things that were not our fault that we shouldn't have had to go through, but we did. But where we are today, and the only way we're gonna move forward is we have to take responsibility. We can't be the victim and expect to grow into maturity and heal. We can't constantly blame other people and hope that they're the ones responsible. We are the only ones who can take responsibility for who we are and where we are headed. No one else can. And that's, that's the, that's, it's a foolish way to live to get constantly stuck in this cycle. It's like putting yourself in a prison of just blaming other people then just recognize God says, I love you, I can heal you, and I've called you, and it's not anybody else's fault, it's you. So follow me and trust me. Grow. That's, that's kind of the calling. In fact, there's a young lady who, who shared her story of just kind of brokenness and the cycle she was stuck in with us. And maybe you can relate with this better, of just how angry she was and blaming other people. This is what she wrote. She said, believe me, being a very easily offended person, I had quite a long list of people I was angry with for years. Most of the times, the reasons were ridiculous, but in my mind, they were enough to make me aggrieved. Somewhere deep inside of me, there was this conviction that people wanted to offend me on purpose, and it was so strongly engraved in my heart. Now, after she came to faith in Jesus and began to grow in her identity and relationship with him, she explained her experience like this. She said, today... It is my personal relationship with Jesus that has become my focus of life and remedy against the heartache. It is solely by the power of prayer, a desperate call for his help, that I got rescued from the feelings of loneliness which bothered me for those, all those years. What changed in her life was that she stopped blaming other people for her pain and her disappointment and rather began to take responsibility and find her worth and value and identity in something bigger and something better. Jesus is that hope And he wants us to pay attention to the foolish mistakes we can make by living our life trying to shift blame and responsibility on other people or caring more about our appearance than the substance behind it. Both of those boil down to character things. But then Jesus, again, he wants to compare this to the wise bridesmaids, the five who who did it right in the story that he told. And here's the two things we can learn from them. Here's the first one. They were wise because they valued their oil. They, they prepared, they were planned, they valued preparation, they valued planning for the what if moments, they valued the worth that it had to do the task that they were called to. This is, you, we can't underestimate how important this is for you and I as we try to apply it to our life. Every time we read about oil oftentimes is, is always associated with anointing and anointing is many, many, many times throughout scripture but especially in the New Testament associated with the gift of God's presence in our life. And so as we read the story, we see these five wise young bridesmaids who didn't hastily give up the oil because of its value, because they knew not only did some olives have to be crushed and a whole process have to be gone through, but there was a cost to having it, and therefore they didn't just give it away. They they were intentional with it and diligent with it, and this is really important because what it talks about throughout the rest of the Old Testament, what Jesus teaches us in the New Testament, is that the the reason he came was, was everything that happened and went down on the Easter, right? 
He's gonna die, he's gonna pay for our sins, but he's gonna become the king. And he's gonna invite all of us who believe in his death and resurrection to follow him as Lord of our life. Not just savior of our life, but the Lord of our life. And we talked about this back at Easter, if you were around back then, that in that, he gives you and I the keys to his kingdom. And so he looks at his disciples then, and he still looks at us now, and he says, hey, I'm gonna go back to heaven, and I'm gonna continue the ministry in this thing that I've begun through each one of you, but I'll be, this is so cool, I'm not gonna just be like for you, cheering for you, and I'm not just gonna be like with you, like over here on the side, I'm gonna be within you, it says. That the, the Holy Spirit is given to us to empower us to follow God and become the people that he's called us to be. And many of us are guilty of being unwise in the fact that we just don't pay enough attention to God's presence that is available in our lives every single day. In fact, John talked about this in 1 John 2, 27. Listen to what he says. He says, as for you, the anointing, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, you received from him remains in you. And you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, that is, that is this anointing is real, it's not counterfeit, just as it's taught you, remain in him. Jesus was crushed on a cross so that you and I could receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit in our life, that we could have his power and his presence in our life every day, which means we don't have to go away on some vacation to the Himalayan mountains and find some guru. We have access to the presence of God every day of our lives. Every day. But some of us, let's be honest, we, we've spent more time with our TV this week than we did with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus just wants us to recognize that is a foolish way to live. Right? It's nothing against TV or whatever the things you are to do. There's just some of us, we had problems this week and the, the thing that we didn't think to do was call upon God and depend upon his presence to help us in those moments. Some of us, we even opened the Bible and read it, but when we were confused and didn't know what to do, we just shut it instead of lean into the presence and ask God. Remember, listen to what John just said. You don't need anyone to teach you this. Like, I shouldn't have to have this job. That's what he was saying. That's what I read. You and I, when we come to God's word, he will call, talk to us. His word says it's alive, like the Holy Spirit helps us understand it and apply it to our life. We just need to lean into it. Here are three things I want you, if you're a note taker, you can write these down. Just know what the Holy Spirit's for and what it's given to us for. And he does three things in our life as he's within us. The first one is he's a revealer of truth. That's what John was just saying. He helps us understand and, and relate with God. And, and go. you don't have to come to church to find answers. You have the Holy Spirit every day in your life. Church is about us coming together collectively in response to our relationship with God. But if this experience, especially if you've been around church for a while, is the only thing that you experience God in, like you have, yet, you have some next steps to take in making that a personal daily part of your life. Because the Holy Spirit is given to you and is within you to reveal the truth of God to you and guide you and make it clear to you. The second thing the Holy Spirit does is it's a gift giver. It helps you understand the giftings that God has given you and how to use those. We talked about this during that lead out series we just had, if you were around. We talked about Ephesians 4. There are other chapters about the gifts of the Spirit God gives, that you and I are meant to be like the body of Christ and through all of our diversity and variety, God uses us to be his expression of love and faithfulness to this world. We are meant to be his ambassadors and the Holy Spirit empowers us to be that. And the third thing is that the Holy Spirit is a fruit producer in our life. The, the, the Holy Spirit's job in empowering us is to help us grow from where we were to where we are to where God is trying to take us. Right, so, so you and I can actually measure our relationship with God against a couple of things. The Apostle Paul in Galatians 5 lists out what he calls the nine fruits of the Spirit. That, that following God means with, the fruit, with his Holy Spirit in us, we should be people who are more loving, uh, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so it means if you've been following God for like the last year, where you were to where you are, you should be a more loving person. You should be more full of joy. You should be more gentle, more kind, more patient. You should have more self-control. And, and if that's not happening, perhaps you are foolishly living in that you're not paying enough attention to just the gravity of this relationship you've been invited into and the gift of God's spirit in your life to take next steps and to grow and become the person that he's called you to be. But here's the second thing that made them wise that you and I have to tune into. The second thing that made these, these other five bridesmaids wise wasn't just that they valued that oil and that whole illustration, but it's also that they focused on eternity. Jesus' words at the end, and this is the, the verse that kind of throws people sometimes in this parable, because you're like, wait, the wedding, and then wait, what? His, his last phrase was this, therefore keep watch, 
because you do not know the day or the hour. All right, so Jesus finishes the parable and then it seems like it's like this apocalyptic, like confusing thing and we don't know what to do with it. So what made the wise virgin, uh, virgins and bridesmaids wise was that they weren't short term, they were long term. They were prepared and therefore they weren't panicked. And what's, this is so important to understanding the parable. What happens in verse five is really important. Both the wise and the foolish bridesmaids got sleepy and fell asleep. So the story isn't about those who stay awake and alert and those who fall asleep or those who are lazy. And the, like, it's not about that. Because think about this. They all fell asleep and went to bed. That's fine. That happens. We all need to do that. What it says that's so important is that the difference between the two of them was that the wise ones went to sleep after they had prepared while the unwise ones went to sleep procrastinating and just putting it off. It is an unwise way to live your life when you are not taking advantage of today, this one day God has gifted you with. Yesterday's gone, tomorrow is not promised, this is it right here. Manage it well, work hard with everything God's trusted you with. He's gifted you with relationships, gifts and times and talents. Use them and work hard and go to bed tonight tired and exhausted because you are enjoying the fullness of life and get up tomorrow and repeat. And so watching doesn't mean like stare off into heaven, let's all twiddle our thumbs while we wait for God to get back. It doesn't mean that. It means be busy being the people of God and just know at any time he could come back. And he is coming back. And we need to live with that perspective because that focused eternal perspective changes everything. It means we're not waiting for someday, but today we're a part of a story that's already determined. God already won. Which means whatever we go through in life should be much smaller in comparison with the eternity that we're a part of, right? The ups and downs of our economy or our political uh, world, they shouldn't shake us in the same way they shake others who don't have faith because our king is still on his throne and we're a part of an eternal story and what's happening today is real, but it's never as big as it seems. It also means that what we go through, the hard things, the obstacles we're up against are never as big as they seem. And with eternity in focus, it means that we don't have to let any of our wounds and our hurts and our past define us today or determine where God is taking us in the future. Because we have a heaven in perspective that should change everything. In fact, I like the way this guy, Art Katz, talked about this. He said this, we may believe in eternity, but to what extent have we actually agreed with the world that eternity is not relevant until after this life? Eternity is not merely a time frame that is endless. It is a profoundly and foremost qualitative thing that is available now. When we begin to see all of our moments set in the context of eternity, we will bring to those moments a seriousness that we would not otherwise have. Because we realize today is the day that God has gifted us with. To be a follower of him, to be in love with him, to be his church and his expression of him to the world around us. And let us today... This is why Jesus invites us to not worry. If you've ever read that in Matthew 6, he's like, don't worry. And you're like, what? Who says that? And especially you, like you're Lord. So that's a commandment. Don't worry. He says, yeah, tomorrow's gone or yesterday was gone. Tomorrow has enough worries of its own. So just deal with today. Don't worry. Because with eternity in focus, it changes our perspective for the here and now. And the purposes that we trust are behind all of it. 